Let's dive right in. This is a walkthrough for the Perovskite Geonode, which you can get for free from Gumroad or BlendSwap at the links provided in the description. This setup requires Blender version 3.1 or newer. Although mainly for perovskites, it can also be used to create standard cubic lattices and unit cells, and I'll showcase that. There are timestamps below for those who want to jump ahead. Before I get into any features, I'll note that both the perovskite object in the outliner, as well as the Geonode's tree here, are both marked as assets, and so you can use this with the Blender asset library if you'd like. When you open the Perovskite Builder, you'll be greeted by a 5x5x5 lattice, and everything you could want to change about this setup will be available in the Geonodes network in the modifier panel. Very simply, I can change the X, Y, and Z counts to a lattice of any size, including 0 or 1. So 0 will completely remove the lattice, 1 will give me a simple unit cell. I could then change, let's say, to a X and Y of 5, with Z as 1, so I have a single layer. I can make this non-uniform by changing any of these aspects. You can also adjust the scale in each axis. This is perfect for if your lattice is tetragonal, say x and y are equal but c is different, or orthorhombic, where all three values are different. And I'll showcase this by bringing the x scale up to 1.5. Next we have tilt features. Tilted perovskites crop up from time to time in the literature, and so these allow you to tilt in the x and y direction. You can either go from 0 to 1, or 0 to minus 1 to flip the direction. The toggle in and out will allow you to go from a alternating facing in and out to a fully alternating lattice. Below this, we have independent toggles for all of the scales, including the center atom, octahedral atoms, cubic atoms, and the respective wireframes. If you want any of them to be invisible, simply drag them to zero. Right under this is an accuracy toggle. If you're using a non-uniform lattice, say the X scale is two, then the accuracy toggle will preserve the uniformity of all of the wireframe. If, however, I were to change the accuracy toggle to one, you'll notice that the X direction of the wireframe is now stretched. So the accuracy toggle is essentially for zero, or accurate, or one, for fast. If you aren't using a wireframe, or if you have a cubic lattice with no distortion in the scale, it is better to use one because it will drastically decrease the amount of geometry in the scene. Notice that right now we have this set to one, and our verts count for this perovskite are 7,500. If, however, I turn the accuracy toggle to zero and select it again, you can see that we've gone up to roughly 200,000. For especially large lattices, it's really worth using the fast setting. However, it is worth noting that even on the fast setting, very large lattices will not be well received by Blender. A 20 by 20 by 20 is about as high as you can get before crashing becomes quite likely. It's also worth noting that the accuracy toggle will let you selectively apply a solidify modifier to the octahedra. This can be useful if you want to assign them a transparent material because of the way Blender handles glass. Very simply, if I come into a render view, you can see that the center atoms are actually being distorted by the glass material that I have on the octahedra. So if I make sure the accuracy is set to zero, I can now add a solidify modifier, and this will essentially tell Blender to make the glass very, very thin so you can see through and actually now see the center atom. Moving on, there are also controls for if you want the octahedra or cubes to be visible. You can see that right here where I can simply show or hide the cubes. By default, the cubes are not showing and the octahedra are, but you can remove those if you'd like. There's also an option to hide or show the outermost cubic atoms. Below this, we have animation controls for each direction of the lattice. If we use Z as an example, we can go from zero to one and the lattice will grow from the bottom up. If instead we were to go from zero to minus one, then it would grow from the top down. So essentially it just flips the direction. And this is true for the other scales as well. You can combine these however you'd like to create different sorts of gradients or patterns in how the animation occurs. Right now, it's worth noting that this is not compatible with having the outermost atoms hidden. So if I try and hide the outermost atoms and then animate one of the scales, you'll notice that they start to appear again very quickly, and this is just because of how this is being handled. Finally, all the way at the bottom, we have controls for placing whatever we'd like on each of the atom positions and also setting the individual materials. By default, the file comes with a test sphere, cube, and Suzanne under the scattering objects collection, and you can easily test this out. Let's say we change all of the cubic atoms to a generic Suzanne, and now we have Suzanne on each position. This is compatible with all the other features that we've introduced so far. So let's take the cubic positions back to a sphere, and we'll change the octahedral atoms to Suzanne, and go ahead and add some tilt. So Suzanne is going to continue working in this setup. And you can put whatever object you want and then choose to use it to scatter on those specific points. 
And all of this is the basic front facing side of the node network. So you have all the controls that you would largely need here. You can also do simple things such as grab the lattice, hit G to move it, R to rotate it in some direction, however you'd like. And you can of course scale it as well, though scaling is better done through the actual toggles that are available here. I mentioned before that this setup can also be used to create and show common lattices and unicells. For instance, let's hide the octahedra and reduce all of the wireframes and atom sizes to zero. We'll bring the X, Y, and Z count down to one for a single unit cell. And now we'll add a little bit of size to the cubic atoms. Let's go to 0.25. This would be the makings of a simple cubic lattice if we were to make these big enough so that they were all touching. However, if we want to bring the center atom scale up to the exact same size, this is essentially the body centered cubic lattice. And if instead of using the center atoms, we use the octahedral atoms, we now have the basics of a face centered cubic lattice. And of course, you can adjust all of the same scales as before. So if we wanted to, we could bring the X scale out or the Z scale out. We could also change the number of repeats. So if we want to actually have a lattice of these, we could bring this number up into different sets of layers or into a whole stack. Let's finally jump over to the Geometry Nodes tab and see the whole setup. I won't break down everything here today, but we'll go through a rough idea of what's going on so that you could adapt this or build on it if you wanted to. You can see from the GeoNodes network that everything is divided into a few parts. There's the grid buildup of the lattice, the master controls that you can use along with a series of experimental and special selections, and all of the components that actually make up the perovskite effect. There's also an integrated 3D grid node here if you'd like to create a 3D grid of your own with several selections readily available. The main thing that I want to focus on is this long stretch between the grid generation and the lattice construction. All of the master controls up here will essentially allow you to select every row, column, or stack independently, as well as assign zero to one factors in either direction to those rows, stacks, and columns. Generally speaking, if there's something very specific that you'd like to do to modify the entire effect, this is the area where you're going to do it. Let's say I want to pull out a specific row, say the third across in the third stack. I can use the output rows and layers. For starters, I'll go ahead and grab the group input, rows, and stack, Shift-D to duplicate these, and then Alt-P after dropping them in place. Simply drag these over so I can use them, and I'll bring this back. To get the effect that I want, I'm going to drag from the rows output and create a compare node. Compare equal, and I'm going to set this to 3. I'll then duplicate this node and connect it up to the Z count. And everywhere where both this node and this node are true, which I can do with a utilities Boolean math, I'm going to move just those rows. I'll do that by coming, adding in a geometry, set position, placing it between the word generation and the lattice creation. And I'll use this as my selection right here. Now I can go ahead and in the X direction or the Y direction rather, I can offset just that single selection. So from the side, you can see, here I have it. We go back exactly minus five. Then I can kind of slide this in or out if I wanted to. And of course, I could animate this if I wanted to do that. If I only wanted to move, let's say, the entire row or the entire stack, then I would just have to plug this selection in by itself. So now I should be able to move the entire stack out. And so you can manipulate the entire grid through a series of these types of controls if you want to do something very specific and very customized. As I mentioned before, there are also factor settings, and these allow you to slide from either 0 to 1 or 0 to minus 1. The output of the node is always from 0 to 1, but the negative direction essentially switches the assignment, and this is actually what drives the animation controls. Let's revert back to our original setup, and from here I'll go ahead and come to Group, and I will add in the experimental circle selection. Now I can connect the geometry here. And I'll very simply add in a delete geometry between the grid creation and the lattice creation. And I'll add that into the selection. Now I can bring this range value up, and this will just start deleting outer positions until I have a sort of spherical particle. And the dimensions of this will essentially depend on your lattice count. So if I go ahead and let's bring the wireframes down, just so it's a little bit more obvious what's happening here. And we'll also hide the outer atoms. You can see now I have some of these cut away into a bit more of a spherical shape. And I can control that by just bringing this range up or down. If you want to use modifiers to impact the whole perovskite, you need to come to the very end of this tree and hook up the realized instances node into the geometry output. 
This will make even small lattices much heavier on the scene, but it also allows you to apply modifiers to the entire tree. And this is very useful for bending lattices or making them follow curves, but it is best kept to smaller lattices. So we'll demonstrate that now by bringing our Z count down to one, and we'll bring our X count up to 10. We'll connect the Realize Instances node. And now if we come back to, in fact, if we just add a modifier, let's go with a simple deform. You can see we can now twist the whole lattice. But if we just had the regular join geometry, it will only work on the atom positions because it's not impacting the octahedra. So we need to make sure that we realize everything. And now we can do various different effects such as bending. So if I go ahead and add in a simple empty, rotate that 90 degrees on the X axis, and then choose this as the origin, I can now bend my perovskite lattice across this axis. A little bit more subtle than that, perhaps, and we can go with the Z, and I can bend it up in this direction. And if I wanted to, yes, I could come back and add extra layers, but this is going to get a little bit heavy pretty quickly, so you can see we're already up to nearly a million verts. So better kept for smaller effects when you're working with something like a single layer. I've purposely made this accessible only from the GeoNodes tree, just because it increases the scene load quite heavily. This has been a long project, and I'm sure I will continue to update it with more features. I will also be using it in future figure recreations to demonstrate some of the ways it can be adapted to unique or complex cases, and how it can be used to create complex perovskite figures or even cubic lattices if you've never really used Blender before. A massive shout out to all my supporters on Patreon who really helped make the creation of tools like this possible. This project was a huge undertaking, and there was a lot of developing, stress testing, and feature consideration that went into this. It really wouldn't be possible without their support. I hope to develop and release more Geonodes in the future that will allow for quick and easy figure building, and I'll be back with more tutorials shortly on how to use this and other Geonodes constructs for making quick and customizable scientific figures. With that, thanks for coming out. Again, this file is available for free on Gumroad and BlendSwap. If you enjoyed this, consider subscribing, sharing with your friends and colleagues, checking out my Patreon, joining the Blender.Science Discord, and until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.